friends, while you are on your feet, I invite you to turn to those nearby and offer a good morning and a welcome. and refreshment. Now, we're not in the usual location because the gym floor is under uh, uh, renovation and refinishing and not quite done yet. So we're going to still go out this door here, but instead of going right to the gym, we're going to head on down to the left to the lounge and, and use the patio and the celebration garden this morning. But the invitation is the same to, to uh, continue the conversation of this family uh, after worship today. Uh, there is nursery available. You can find that through the doors just behind the technical desk. Uh, and uh, there is Sunday Club for those four and, uh, and older this morning. Uh, today we are so very pleased to welcome the Reverend Dr. Brian Thorpe uh, to our worship to as part of our summer sermon series, Faith in the City. Now last week, uh, the Reverend Dr. Jason Biasi spoke to us uh, about the city of God, the, the holy city, that image found in Revelation, uh, the richness of God's vision for heaven and, and for earth right here and now, and how God yearns for the extreme of, of God's abundance to fill the city, and how in fact God can surprise us and in ways God, that God is already at work in our city to uh, remake it according to God's dream. And today, uh, Brian will call us to lean into an understanding of uh, living uh, radically hospitable lives uh, uh, in the city or wherever it is we find ourselves exercising our faith. Uh, uh, hospitality uh, may challenge us, will invite us to... Uh, open our faith, whether it be in the city or the sailboat or playing the back nine. Uh, now, Brian is no stranger to the congregation, and uh, he has minister, helped minister here a couple of years ago for a period of time, uh, and uh, was most helpful, and has also offered his gifts to congregations in the province of Quebec, Saskatchewan, and elsewhere in British Columbia. He's also served uh, as the executive secretary of uh, British Columbia Conference of the United Church and has offered his wisdom to the church on the issue of residential schools. And these days he's an absolute gift to Ryerson United Church where uh, he is their minister emeritus. And, and Brian, we're just delighted uh, to have you with us today. Uh, as part of our series, there is a printed guidebook uh, it's also available online on our church website. It, it's developed to help you deepen your experience of this summer sermon series. Uh, maybe you'll uncover new ways of seeing God at work in your community or in your own life. Now, uh, I bring welcome uh, from myself, Reverend Philip Newman, the lead minister here, from uh, Reverend Simon Lassour, my colleague, and uh, Jillian Jackson, who will be offering our prayers, uh, Jerry Van White, our Minister of Music, and we're glad that Peter Alexander is offering his gift of music uh, among us today. Uh, one announcement I have to offer, uh, when you go to coffee, um, you will be able to see some wonderfully and beautifully creative dried flower cards. Cornelia has made these. It's part of a, a mission project. She's partnering with her son in South Africa to sponsor an African family. And if you visit her table, space is at a premium today in the lounge and patio, but she'd be glad for you to, to visit uh, and uh, her table and just ask any questions uh, you'd like to ask. Good morning. Good morning. Now you might be wondering 
this morning, why am I staring at someone's breakfast? <laughs> Over the, the last few weeks, we invited you to submit pictures of where you see God in your community. And uh, this picture was sent to us by Amanda Wang, one of the, uh, one of the teens that's part of our, uh, our youth programs here at the church. And um, she sent it because it was, it was a moment she describes uh, being alone one morning and just taking time to herself. And it was a picture that she took of that moment because there was just something about that time that felt holy. And so I invite you just to take a moment to uh, enter into the picture and, um, and attend to God's presence in this image. says it felt as though God was there. And there's so many teens that use their, their cameras for all sorts of purposes, and um, we're really grateful for an amazing community of kids who, who use their cameras to try to capture a sense of God's presence in this world. And so, Amanda, we uh, would like to invite you to come and light the Christ candle this morning.
morning. Will you join with me in prayer? We are on the steps, God, knocking on your door. All the familiar thoughts and phrases flow, but do we dare enter? You are so gracious and righteous, and we have been invited into your presence. But what will take us over the threshold? We long to enter and share in your abundance. Open the door. Welcome us in. Holy Spirit, come dwell with us here in this place of refuge. Don't close the door. Leave it open behind you. Could you call in the weary, the destitute, the cynics, the critics, the perpetrators, the troublemakers, the haters, the depressed, the rejected, and all those others waiting behind those waiting to be invited in, waiting for us to invite them in. What grace brought us into this space of your love? What goodness! We thank you for gathering us in this company of fellow travelers, weary from the world. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for the leadership of this congregation. Jesus Christ, we long for you to teach us the words that welcome. Teach us how to open hearts to your love. And when we dare to speak and do the gospel, can you remove from us our fear of difference, our fear of relationship complexity, our fear of disagreements, our fear of vulnerability, our fear of being seen for who we really are? And well, our fears... Can you remove them? We ask in the week ahead you press us to open just a little more to see the miraculous vision you have for each of us, for our church, and for the city we live in. We whisper it tentatively because we need your courage and strength to trust that what we know is possible is doable. For courage and strength to trust, this is our need. We know you care, Lord. We know you are there for us. And we ask you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to move us to care enough for the world, for us to sing a new hallelujah to those who need to know you. We long to be a church that reaches out of ourselves into new ways of being. And we are asking for your help to show us where you need us to arrive. We are ready to serve. And if we're not ready enough, Turn our will to align with yours to get us over the bump, to trust in you. God, another violent week. More than 80 killed in Nice. A small girl murdered in Calgary. Political unrest in Turkey. We are sorry. We are sorry, Lord, where we have failed to bring peace into the world. We too weep at the carnage and the loss. We pray for your healing presence to all those now working through the dark tunnels of grief. Shelter them and us in the shadow of your cross. Make the burdens light again. Take the sorrows from our hearts and remind us there is hope in the promise of the cross. Even when our hearts and social media do not speak to us of hope, speak to us again your promise of new life. We hold up to you, Lord, these precious people in our community in need of your presence today. Judy, Barbara, Michael, Brad, Alistair, Camilla, David and Audrey, and the Shelter family. And we each name in a moment of silence now our own secret burden or gratitude we brought with us this morning to share with you. Your love never fails, and when you say it is done, Lord, it is done. So we surrender these prayers, those spoken and unspoken, into your hands, knowing you are infinitely more creative and more powerful than we could ever fathom. Accept our praise and thanksgiving with the words your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your
the children are welcome to head to their Sunday Club programs with Simon and Dylan and leaders. You can do that now. <coughs> the offering that you made last week empowered ministry within our congregation and in response uh, to needs in the community. Uh, it also helps support work of ministries uh, beyond our congregation. It empowered a, a vibrant children's camp to be able to be experienced earlier this month. And this ministry happens because of your generous support. And I invite you once again to uh, give generously as we worship God through the sharing of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. Let our offerings be received.
because we're still on our feet. <laughs> uh, we share now in ancient words. Uh, creeds are often a starting place for the body of Christ to, to get a sense of what we are about, whether you embrace every word and phrase or not. But this Apostles' Creed connects us with many of the saints who've gone by. Let's share these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. of scripture. May our hearts be moved. May our minds be awakened. May we feel the spirit in our midst. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our uh, first reading is from Genesis. And, uh, Genesis 18. Uh, verses 1 to 10a, Genesis 18. This particular passage describes an event in the life of Abraham and Sarah. They're advanced in years. They're in the wilderness. And in the midst of what must have been a time of confusion, of uncertainty, three strangers appear. We see, witnessed, a great act of hospitality, but this is not unique, because Abraham is simply exercising the rules of hospitality that are rooted in his community, in his faith. Hear these words from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Marm, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. These three strangers were agents of the divine. Abraham did as custom told, his act of generosity entertained angels unaware, and for that we are grateful. Our second reading is also a story of hospitality. It's a story told of Jesus on the road to Jerusalem, on the road to that city which held such portent of horror and death awaiting. 
And yet on the road he stops at dear friends, and hospitality ensues. From Luke's Gospel. Now as they were on their way, he entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed her into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O God. Amen. I have a colleague who is actually a student in a course I taught a while back who is just starting to preach. 
She's really new at the game and is quite anxious about it all. If it happens she's preaching this Sunday, and the text that she's using is that text from Luke about Mary and Martha. And so we talked on the phone a couple of times about this. I knew that she had completed the sermon a couple of weeks ago, which is a real mark of somebody new in the game. <laughs> But a few days ago, she called me. She called after those horrific events in the streets of Nice. And she said, I'm going to have to start all over, aren't I? She was concerned because she felt if she just preached the sermon she had prepared without any reference to what was happening in the world, particularly when that happening is so tragic, so unimaginable, even though we've been that road so many times before, it still horrifies us. She felt she just couldn't do it. I said, well, you don't need to start over. But what you do need to do is to acknowledge where we're at in the world, because in our Christian community, we don't live isolated from the world. We live rather in a world which we proclaim week after week has been created by our Creator to be good. We live in a world which Jesus proclaimed in his ministry to be beloved by God. And so it is important that we be rooted in that world, particularly when we talk about faith and about what our Christian tradition offers to us living in the midst of it all. Now, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that in fact the story we have today is not as removed from the world as I had once thought when we started that conversation. It's a very domestic story, a very tender story. It's a story that has just a few characters, indeed, really only three, Martha, Mary, and Jesus. At first glance, it seems so far removed from everything that's going on, from the horrors that surround us, from the big stories. But in fact, it's set in the midst of a big story. Because earlier in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 9, we are told that Jesus turns his face toward Jerusalem. He begins to journey toward that city. And we're also told later, by after several verses after the story of Mary and Martha, that as he approaches Jerusalem, he laments over the city itself. He uh, says this in Luke chapter 4, 13, 31. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets. Jesus is heading toward a city that has its own history of terror and terror awaits. Jesus is not just going to Jerusalem. He's going to Orlando. He's going to Bangladesh. He's going to Brussels. He's going to Paris. He's going to Nice. That's where Jesus is on the road to war. And so it's appropriate for us in this very moment to be on that road with Jesus. Because you see, this story of where he stops along the way is important for two reasons. First, when Jesus journeys toward human tragedy, that's not the whole of the story. In fact, this journey is filled with teaching, with miracles. Just last Sunday, the story that precedes Mary and Martha was the story of the Good Samaritan. There is an abundance of human story-making 
of love, of care and compassion in the midst of it all. What this means is that the human journey does have tragic moments. But what Christian narrative and faith proclaims is that those moments do not encompass the whole. We do not become so consumed by the tragic that we fail to see the alternate vision which is constantly there with us on the road. The other thing that is important is the recognition that in these little domestic stories, we find a truth which is far greater ultimately than all of the political and religious machinations which lead to such chaos, such terror, such tragedy. So with that in mind, let's go on the road with Jesus, on the road toward Jerusalem, on the road toward Orlando, toward Nice, on the road toward Bangladesh, toward Brussels, toward Paris, and all those other cities of our world. And as we're on the road, let's stop at the home of Mary and Martha. Now there are three things we need to say about this very familiar story of Mary and Martha. The first thing is, and this is so important, this story is not intended to be an attack on homemakers, on chefs, on those who do dishes. We have a habit in the church of speaking of Mary's and Martha's in that very facile sort of way. We need to look at the story a little more carefully because there's one very small detail that says volumes. When Jesus arrives at the home of Mary and Martha, Martha greets him and welcomes him into her home. Well, of course, wouldn't we all do that? But what we miss in that is the fact that she is acting out of an ancient tradition. That tradition that we first saw with Abraham. The head of the household goes to greet whoever is coming through the door, whoever is coming in, whoever is being welcomed in. Martha is the head of this household. Indeed, some scholars have wondered whether or not Martha might be one of those women mentioned in Luke chapter 8, those nameless women who through their resources helped the ministry of Jesus, those women who would continue to support Paul in his journeys, Martha is a household head. She's in charge. She is not in any way, shape, or form subservient to Mary. They are sisters, and given the fact that it's Martha doing the welcoming, she is undoubtedly the elder sister. That's the first thing to recognize, that Martha cannot be discounted. She is central and she is important. The second thing that is so important to acknowledge is that this is not a story about the secondary nature of hospitality. Again, it would seem that way. Martha is consumed with preparing meals, for making sure the house is ready, for doing everything possible to create a meal, a table. That's not secondary. That's central to the gospel. From the very first miracle of the wedding feast at Cana to the Last Supper and many times in between, Jesus' ministry is dependent upon sharing the meal, sharing the table, being together. This is critical. It's central. So that's the second thing that we dare not do, is to underestimate the role that Martha is playing in providing the table, the food. So then, if that's not what it's about, what is it about? Well, I want to suggest that it actually is a story of the hospitality, but not what we imagine it to be about. 
Rather, it's a story about the lack of hospitality between two sisters. It's a story, rather, about sibling rivalry. It's a story about the conflicts which exist in families, the resentments that I don't need to lay out for any of you. You all know exactly what it's about. You've been there. On the road to Jerusalem, where nations will fight against nations, where tribes will fight against tribes, where religious sisters and brothers coming out of the Abrahamic tradition will view each other with enmity, that family drama that is so tragic in our modern world finds its echoes in the intimacy of the human family itself. When Martha goes to Jesus and says, Look, I'm doing all the work. My sister hasn't lifted a finger to help me. What are you going to do about it? Do you recognize what Martha is asking here? She's not really asking to be relieved of her duties. In fact, I hunch that Martha's one of those people that, if her heart were really true, would say she really prefers to be in charge and do most of it herself anyway. That's not what she's asking. She's asking Jesus to reprimand her sister, to take her side. She wants to triangulate Jesus into this fight with her sister, a fight that may have precious little to do with housework. And Jesus does not do what is asked of him. And that's so important. Jesus does not take sides in this conflict. In fact, what he does is he speaks to Martha. And this too is so important because when we think that Martha is the one who's ultimately really in the wrong, and I'll let you in on a little secret, I believe in this story, no one's in the wrong. It's those conflicts that are so rooted that you can never really remember who initiated it all. When we think it's Martha that's in the wrong, we imagine Jesus saying to her in a harsh voice, Martha, Martha. But you know, that's our intonation. The gospel doesn't tell us that's the way Jesus said it. It's just as credible to imagine Jesus saying to her in a voice so tender, Martha, Martha. And with that voice, he talks about her distraction with all of her tasks. He talks about her burden. It has nothing to do with Mary. It has to do with a frantic kind of energy on her part, which doesn't allow her to enter fully into the hospitality. The hospitality of listening to Jesus, of being with him, of sensing something of his mission, of his transforming love. She's so busy, she doesn't have time for that. It also, her distractions, her frantic energy, prevents her from entering into real hospitality with her sister, to sit with her sister and to allow hospitality be not just food, not just a properly set table, but truly being with one another and listening to one another. This story is so domestic. It's so simple. A story of two sisters who are getting on each other's nerves, and Jesus who enters in and invites them into a new way of being hospitable to one another, of being with one another, of being with him, and discovering in the midst of the hospitality, the table, the food, the beautiful household that is so clean and fresh, in the midst of all of that, to discover with each other the transforming love that comes in Jesus' way. I mentioned that Jesus was on the road to Jerusalem and to all those other cities. And it is true that we know the end of the story. We know tragedy awaits. 
we know that there will be another scene of terror in that city, just as there are scenes of terror in too many cities of this world. But we also know this, that Jesus refuses to see that as the only part of the story of faith. Rather, he stops and enters into hospitality with two sisters. And in doing that, creates for us an image, a little picture of the ultimate goal of creation itself, of God's will for us, of a renewed relationship, of tenderness, of love, a picture that ultimately will be the one that lasts, will be the picture that sustains us through all of the terrors of this world, a promise of transcendence of new life in the midst of it all. So when my friend worried about what was happening in the world and how it would affect a sermon, she needn't have worried because the message is eternal. The message is tender, it's domestic, but it's powerful. And what it says is that Jerusalem and Orlando and Brussels and Paris and Bangladesh and Istanbul, all of those places have tragedy, stoning of prophets, but they also carry within them the human power of love, the God-given grace, which can never be destroyed in the end by it all. And so we thank Mary and Martha and Jesus for this moment in the midst of the journey. Amen.
And now, friends, let us go out into the world, God's beloved world, with open hands, open doors, open hearts, ready to receive the stranger, ready to offer hospitality even to those siblings with whom we have so much tension, ready to welcome Christ into our midst, to feed and to sit at his feet, and to feel life transformed. And as we go, may the blessing of God our Creator, God our Redeemer, and God the Spirit go with us this day and always.